And hello, this is Dory Clark, and I am here with Newsweek. This is our weekly interview show, Better. And today we're talking about how to adapt to exponential change, which all of us are seeing all over the place. We are here with Jonathan Brill. Jonathan is the author of the new book. It's called Rogue Waves. Jonathan, so glad to have you here. It's amazing to be here. Thank you so much for having me, Dory. Absolutely. And Jonathan, the, the first question for, for you, as I was reading the book, I was actually not familiar with the concept of rogue waves. I mean, you know, I could figure it out. But apparently rogue waves are not just uh, a formulation. They're actually a legit thing in the ocean. So before we dive into your metaphor, explain to us what the heck is a rogue wave specifically and how does that apply to our future forecasting and our understanding of exponential change? That's a great question. So I think the place to start is actually a step back which is over the last decade, we've heard a lot about black swan events, these, these incalculable risks that pop out of nowhere. And CEOs, uh, executives, uh, certain presidents, they like to say things are just black swan events. We couldn't have known. But the reality is often they are calculable because the, the, the multiple waves of disruption uh, that we know are going to occur they overlap in a specific time and place and become unmanageable. So some really good recent examples. Uh, 2008, uh, financial crash is a really good example of this. Um, COVID is a really good example of this. The recent 100,000-year floods in Germany and, uh, and, and China are a, a good example of this and the increase of the likelihood of those floods. Uh, and more recently, just this week, uh, Kabul, the, the uh, fall of Afghanistan. So the point is that we can start to, if we look at individually manageable trends uh, and understand what happens when they overlap and they collide in specific times and places, understand what they mean for the future. And you asked, like, technically, what is a rogue wave? In the deep ocean, what you see is that this happens actually quite frequently. What's happening right now as we speak, that a dozen maybe more uh, small waves overlap in a specific time and place and become massive waves that can sink even the largest ships. And uh, they, they likely see, sink many ships every year. Yeah, it was actually incredibly frightening to, <laughs> to read about r these rogue waves that, uh, you know, the idea that a hundred foot wave can basically just come out of nowhere. Uh, I was always a little hesitant about the ocean. Now I am more hesitant. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but me metaphorically, uh, you are exactly right that it does seem to be coming true in so many facets of our lives. So Jonathan, uh, the, the next question, the sort of logical next question that I have for you is about what do, what do we do about this? Just about everybody wants to be able to future-proof their career, future-proof their business. If we know that rogue waves are out there, if they are out in the ocean uh, or, or the ether waiting to get us, what are the things, what, you know, what's the first thing we should all be doing in order to future-proof ourselves? Sure. I, I think we need to think about, uh, th th there's two ways to look at this. One is uh, you look at risk and you say, oh, what are the downsides? The other is you, say, you look at risk as volatility and you say, what are the upsides? Right? What are the opportunities if I position myself better, if I'm more resilient, how do I drive growth? If you believe, as I do, that most of the indicators suggest that the next decade is going to be more volatile than the last three or four, that suggests that we want to rethink our corporate strategies uh, and, and our leadership strategies because the, the current uh, approach of compound growth where we'll do 6% better next year, 6% better the year after that, that doesn't work in, when you start looking at the world of compound volatility right? These radical changes. And the reality is, if you take a look over the last you know, several decades, more billionaires are minted in downturns than in upturns because of that volatility, because they prepare to be resilient and to take advantage of those disruptions when everybody else is just trying to get along and sail on smooth seats. 
That's fascinating, Jonathan. Thank you. We are here with Jonathan Brill. He is the author of the new book. It's called Rogue Waves. If you want to learn more about Jonathan and his work, you can go to jonathanbrill.com slash rogue waves. And we would love to see who is here. So please feel free to type into the chat box. Let us know who you are, where you're viewing from, and also type in your questions for Jonathan into the chat box because we'd love to hear what's on your mind. And so actually to that point, Jonathan, continuing the metaphor of rogue waves, uh, a great question came in from Minx in Oakland. She wants to know, okay, if, if we acknowledge that there are in fact rogue waves, what's the, what's the right plan? Do we surf it or do we dive deep? Do we go under the wave? Can we do that? Uh, br break down the metaphor for us. What should we actually be doing, Jonathan? Well, I, I think you answered both questions. And one of the fascinating things about writing a book and, and developing a metaphor like this is you, you come out and instantly people ask, are we the boat or are we the wave? Can you unrogue a wave? Can you, should you dive under or should you get on top? Like fascinating ways of looking at the problem. And, and I think the answer makes is both. Uh, that what we need to do is think about resilience, right? How, like if we don't ride the wave effectively, how do we, uh, recover faster than our competitors. And then the second is how do we position ourselves to ride it? Because uh, that's that's the bigger opportunity, right? But even if you get hit and everyone else gets hit, if you recover faster, if you're sailing again while everybody else is trying to bail out their boat, you still win. And so this is a, a valid approach, whether you're successful or uh, whether you fail at predicting the future. I think what we need to do is we need to think, and I'm getting maybe a level too deep here, you know, about what are the impacts of different types of disruption on our company, on our, on our finances, on our operations, uh, on our external environment, and on things like our strategy, you know, things like uh, our demand forecasts. And if you start to think about, okay, well, what would happen if, if this happened over here and that happened over there uh, and they collided, what would that do to my company? If you, if you look at enough different... Uh, situations like that, what you find is you future-proof yourself against almost any situation. When you take a look at a company like Amazon, right, they got hit by this rogue wave uh, by COVID like everybody else. But, but, and I think this is the important thing, they had a really good understanding of how their organization worked. They could pull and push the levers without the system breaking. The result of that was they were able to absorb about 10 years of growth in their retail business in 90 days. Now, what I want to ask you is if I just, you know, kind of waved my magic wand and removed all of the blockers to doing that in your organization, the money, the personnel, the infrastructure, could you do it? The point okay. is, this isn't about being a rich company or a poor company or a tech company or, or you know, uh, a traditional company. It's about a mindset because my friends, they're family farmers in Ohio. They service 800 of the top 1,000 restaurants in the world. One day, literally all of their clients disappeared. They shipped more vegetables this year to consumers, which weren't a market for them in January of 2020, than they did in 2019 in their entire business. Think about that for a second. Are you ready to make that kind of pivot, that kind of shift? And the reason they were able to do it in both cases was that they thought about, okay, what would happen if, you know, if we did get hit, if we did go underwater, how would we respond? And they were ready. The result of this in the case of Amazon is that they're probably going to, you know, retain a lot of that growth. In fact, they've grown so much that looks like they're going to have to go into building department stores, uh, is what was said today. And uh, my, my friend's farm, you know, well, they've got a whole new business and their old business is coming back online. They're going to have a really, really good year uh, in 2022. Uh, and that's pretty constant about a uh, constant way that companies that take Rogue Wave serious uh, that, that have real resilient growth strategies um, in terms of their performance. They tend to do about twice as well uh, during the downturn, and they tend to sustain that growth after everybody else catches up. That's such an interesting point, Jonathan. Thank you. We're here with Jonathan Brill. He's the author of the book, Rogue Waves. Again, if you want to learn about Jonathan, go to his website, jonathanbrill.com. And his book is at is jonathanbrill.com slash rogue waves. If you want to make sure you never miss one of our weekly Newsweek interview series, be sure to go to my website, doryclark.com. You can sign up for my newsletter there and you will get reminders about these great conversations. And so we want to greet some of the awesome guests that are uh, 
uh, tuning in and joining us. We've got Carrie from LA, David from Indianapolis, Megan's here from Dallas, and Linda from Atlanta. We've got Gina from Florida. We're so glad to have you all here. Roy's here from Philly. Uh, so happy to have all of you and many more. Now, Jonathan, I suspect that this is probably a both and as well, uh, but I'd love for you to weigh in on whatever whatever piece of this you want to grab. But Gina is curious. She says, what's, what's more important? What should we be doing, Jonathan? Is it more about learning to be more effective at recognizing the rogue wave risks or that we just need to stop pretending that they don't exist? What, what are your thoughts about this? I, I think it's, I, I think it's a both and uh, the way I talk about it. And, 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 and I think there's an, there's an additional and after the end, uh, which is we need to be able to, uh, responds to and exploit the change and have a culture that allows us to do that. And it's what I call the ABCs of resilient growth. A being awareness. First, we need to be aware that they exist. Uh, B being behavior, right? We have to have the skills. We have to have the behaviors that allow us to understand and exploit the change. And C, culture. We have to have the processes and incentives that make it uh, possible to practice these behaviors, that make it uh, that encourage people looking outside of the organization instead of looking in. And these are real challenges, especially for performance-driven organizations where a lot of people tend to be compensated on the quarter, right? There's no, there's no real incentive to optimize for the future. The, the incentive is all to optimize for the present. And in the book, we talk a lot about how you can make those changes, how we uh, work to make those changes at HP, the computer company, a uh, printer company. Uh, and, uh, we talk a lot about how that's worked in a range of different fields as well. And the, the reality of this is it's really easy to say, hey, you know, this is a board level decision. That certainly helps. But the reality is there are small things, simple things, things you can do today, just as, as simple as getting better at giving directions to your employees that will absolutely increase the level of innovation, absolutely increase their ability to look outside at the situation and tie it to those quarterly results that you have to drive. Yeah, that's a really good point, Jonathan. Thank you. Uh, that's great. We're here with Jonathan Brill, author of Rogue Waves. And a question came in, Jonathan, that I think is is interesting. Obviously, with the wildfires out west, with the strange weather conditions that we're seeing, including you were alluding earlier to the unprecedented floods in Germany, uh, climate change is on a lot of people's minds. And Carrie had a question about that. She wants to know, how, how do rogue waves factor into climate change? Uh, does climate change require a different response? than when you're competing for profits or talking about innovation in a corporate context. What are, what are your thoughts about that? That's a, that's a big and complex question. So, so first, interesting factoid, when the ocean gets warmer, the number of rogue wave events increase. Um, so I think that's a good metaphor for everything we're talking about. Uh, as, as we see climate change, uh, the number of unlikely events will increase, but it's not just because of climate change. I think that you know, the economy is moving faster. Uh, I think that there are more people entering the global middle class. Every time someone moves from the, the rural uh, poverty into the Western style, say Austin, uh, New York, San Francisco med middle class, their resource use increases about 32 times. Now, if you think we're going to put another billion people into that middle class in the next decade, another couple billion by 2050, that's a significant change, right? That's a significant change that, that is going to impact the environment, but it's also going to cause uh, resource constraints and other kinds of conflict even before uh, we see the real impact uh, on the climate. Uh, in terms of thinking about climate change and the economic opportunity, I think that's a huge uh, piece of the puzzle that, you know, when you have to start thinking about retrofitting cities, when you have to start thinking about rebuilding infrastructure, when you have to start thinking about how do you sense and understand these changes, right? That's the next business. That's the next trillion dollars is figuring out how to resolve these challenges, how to become a better humanity. And so I, I think that rogue waves are tied to massive economic growth when policy is, is written right, when, when entrepreneurs uh, and investors get it around their heads that the, the bigger opportunities might not be a quarter out, they might be a number of years out. And it's worth making the investment. 
Yeah, it's such a good point, Jonathan. And Jonathan, uh, of course, one, uh, one great source of pride for me is that you were someone that I interviewed in my forthcoming book, The Long Game. Uh, for people who are interested in learning more about that, you can check that out and click uh, for different options to find out more and pre-order at doryclark.com slash long game. And, and I know we're, one second, I know we're talking my book right now, but I want to say your book was exceptional and your books have changed my life. Uh, you, absolutely. Everything you do actually has changed my life. So thank you very much for that. You're, you're a power of light in the world. I, I am honored. Thank you for that, Jonathan. And as I think back on our conversation and one of the things that I quote you on in the book, a, I, a phrase that you used has stayed with me, and I'm hoping you can explicate it here because I, I think it is worth uh, diving into a little bit. You talked about how when the incentives are wrong, smart people can lose by winning. Can you explain what you mean by that and why that is so perilous? Yeah. So I, I think when, when you take a look at uh, uh, organization, like you said, where all of the compensation is really on the short term, that might be really appropriate for maybe you know, lower level managers. But when you start getting into senior management, if you're encouraging people to, to what they call milk the cow, you know, the reality is you're, you're not feeding it. And eventually that, you know, the, 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 the golden goose, let's switch the metaphors, you know, is going to run out of eggs. And so you got to figure out how you balance that, right? How you balance uh, growth, you know, and resilience. And it, it's, it is a balancing act. The reality is you can do both. It's hard uh, and it's tied to incentives, right? Um, not necessarily like millions of dollars. A lot of it's short-term incentives, right? Like, do I get credit for uh, doing a good experiment that fails, right? Or do I only get credit for doing a good experiment that succeeds? You know, or even worse, do I get fired for a good experiment that fails? Right. Like I, I, I had a boss once who uh, uh, decided he was going to do something. The entire industry thought it was going to be a good idea. He executed well. It was a good strategy for the company based on how much they were willing to invest. And yet and yet the thing failed. It wasn't because of him. It was because there was one winner. The, the company had underinvested and he lost his job as a result. You can't set up incentive structures like that and expect innovation. It just doesn't work. Yeah, it's absolutely true and a good point. We're here with Jonathan Brill. His book is Rogue Waves. And Jonathan, a question came in from one of our viewers here on LinkedIn about how do we apply this in a corporate context? They want to know how often do you actually think that corporates should be reviewing this? If, you, if you're advising a CEO, let's say, and they say, all right, Jonathan, I've bought in. Yes, I, I believe there's rogue waves out there. Is this an annual review? Is this, is this a quarterly review? How often do we need to, to keep checking for the threats on the horizon so that we can be prepared for them? So I, I think it's a constant review cycle. Uh, I, it, it really depends on the type of organization and the size of organization, right? You take a look at Amazon or Google, having a dozen guys or uh, women in the corner, right? That's not going to be an issue. It doesn't hit the bottom line. If you're a hundred person organization, it totally does. So there are ways to work with this. You know, I do a lot of work with, uh, you know, with, with, with smaller organizations who want to outsource this kind of thing. But the reality is you need people inside who are passionate about it, who are tied to the C-suite uh, and who are removed from those quarterly, uh, you know, quarterly results, um, you know, and are really being asked to look at the longer term. Uh, you know, so I guess the answer is you can do it annually, but in terms of when you look at as a CEO, but you want to set up those early warning signals. You know, if, if the, if the tsunami buoy goes off, you know, they, they get to you really quick in case you're not looking. Yes, absolutely. And I love the engagement here. We're having great folks asking great questions. If you have something on your mind for Jonathan Brill, author of Rogue Waves, please feel free to type into the chat box. Let us know your question. If you're just tuning in, let us know where you're uh, calling in from. We're, we're excited to welcome you here. And Megan Morrow had a question for you, Jonathan. Uh, she, she's loving the uh, nautical metaphors here that you have to shift and pivot in, in order to stay afloat. She says, <laughs> what else do you anticipate will need to happen for organizations? 
organizations to survive. As you're, as you're thinking about, you know, let's call it the next five years, are there specific things that companies need to be thinking, doing, responding to that may in particular not be on their radar right now? So I think the, the question is specific to each company. Uh, into each geography, right? There are different things happening to uh, the same kinds of companies in China or in Indonesia as the United States, but the results will be very, uh, very different because of what's going on in those places. Um, what I would say is you want to get really deep on what are the social, economic, and technological trends that are occurring that seem manageable, right? Artificial intelligence and automation seems manageable. The change in uh, demographics that's causing middle managers to retire out of organizations, that seems manageable. Uh, uh, shifts in global trade, right? They seem manageable. What happens when all of those hit at the same time, say in 2025? Uh, and, and all of the G20, all of the largest economies in the world, they, they have this issue of these aging populations. They have this issue of this automation. And you see higher U.S.-China tensions. Uh, what does that mean for your company? It might mean a different thing for a service company, you know, that's just operating locally uh, as, um, as, a manufa as a global manufacturer. But the reality is if you're a service company, say you're, say you're a restaurant and all of a sudden you can't get plastic plates or paper plates from China and you're doing a takeout business because it's post COVID. What do you do about that? Right. We need to be thinking about those sorts of issues, right? Those overlaps. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point. So maybe you could actually walk us through a case study, if you don't mind, because I can imagine a lot of folks listening here, they're, they're professionals, they may be business leaders, and they're saying, all right, I'm, I'm with you, Jonathan. Um, you're exactly right. Threats compound on top of one another. It's rare that you might have uh, one big change at a time. Often it is multiple changes on top of each other. And just like you have a patient that's on eight different medicines and they start to interact with each other in weird ways, that's how uh, socioeconomic, sociopolitical, uh, epidemiological trends that we're facing unfold as well. But at a certain point, the analysis gets so complex when you have all of these multiple variables. I can imagine that people might say, well, what do I do about it? Even if I know that the supply chain is at risk, or even if I know that COVID might stretch on for you know, X amount of time, uh, how, how do I actually tease it out enough to get actionable insights from that? What would you recommend? Right. That, that's, a, that's a great question. Uh, and, and this is kind of the first thing I get, especially from super operational people. It's like, you can't prepare for everything that could ever happen. You know, something else will just happen. And, and that's true. Um, but they tend to exist in kind of in categories, the thing, the, the, the shape, what I call the shapes of rogue waves, right? Things uh, tend to move from static threats. So we thought that these were hundred year uh, floods in Germany that we were talking about. Uh, but it turns out that in the mid nineties, and then I think in 2012, there were also hundred year floods. Like it sounds like maybe they miscalculated or what we thought was a static threat was becoming a dynamic threat. Right. So that's one of the major things to ask is like, what happens if these things that we think are risks uh, have different behaviors than we thought, or opportunities have different behaviors than we thought. What happens when something goes from symmetric to asymmetric? What, um, so in uh, 2011 or 2012, the Fukushima nuclear reactor had, uh, had, had uh, failure. Toyota had a lot of uh, vendors up there and had supply chain disasters. Afterwards, and this was the, the leanest of lean manufacturers. I mean, these guys invented lean manufacturing. They said, okay, we're going to put some buffers in our system in places of critical failure. The result was in 2016, when there was a, uh, when there was a natural disaster in Taiwan, they had six months of spare semiconductors, and they were able to keep manufacturing when their competitors had problems. In the face of COVID, when the same thing happened, they were able to keep manufacturing uh, when their competitors have had problems. So they, they took this thing that uh, was would have been a symmetric threat in the face of COVID and made it asymmetric. It didn't impact them. It just impacted everybody else. You look at synchronous or asynchronous, right? Like, does everybody get hit at the same time or do we get hit at different times? Uh, and And... 
like those are those are different types shapes of threat or shapes of opportunity. So when you take a look at like climate uh, uh, carbon taxes, right, where where they're trying to take this thing that's asynchronous, where I pollute, uh, but someone else gets impacted uh, twenty years down the road, and make it synchronous. I pollute and I get penalized. Uh, you can see things that are permanent become temporary or the other way around. So uh, going going into the, the beginning of COVID, you know, very few people thought that, hey, nine months later, we'll be rolling out a national vaccine plan. And these things, in many cases, will be over, you know, 90% effectiveness. Like, no one really thought that, or very few people <laughs> really thought that. And it moved uh, the, the threat of COVID from, you know, a permanent threat to one that's more, it's endemic for sure, but it, it, it's temporary and, and manageable now. And we're, getting, we're, we're starting to see the opening up, even though things are closing at the moment, we're starting to see the opening up uh, of, of the economy in the U.S., you know, and a year later. Yeah, these are these are great points, Jonathan. Thank you. We're here again for people just tuning in. We're here with Jonathan Brill. He's the author of the book Rogue Waves. And if you want to learn more about Jonathan, sign up to re receive his updates. Go to jonathanbrill.com slash rogue waves. And if you want to make sure you never miss one of our weekly Newsweek shows, it's every Thursday at noon Eastern, nine Pacific. You can go to doryclark.com slash LI. That stands for LinkedIn. And you can subscribe to my my LinkedIn newsletter and follow me there and you'll get regular updates. Next week, we have Stanford professors Naomi Bagdonis and Jennifer Auker talking about the use of humor in business. Now, Jonathan, we probably have time for about one more question. And one thing that I wanted to turn to, which I thought was especially interesting in your book, you say, I'll, I'll read a quote here, resilience is your new strategy for growth. Now, typically, of course, that word implies surviving something, bouncing back from something, but you're actually using it uh, to talk about building and growth. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. tell us a little bit more about how this works in the world of Rogue Waves. Yeah. So for the last 40 years, we've, we've built our organizations, assuming a couple of things that I think are really dangerous. Uh, first is that the, the world will continue to, to become more harmonized. The evidence that we have is that there's going to be a lot more geopolitical tension in the next, you know, in the next decade, the next two decades. You know, Kabul, the fall of Afghanistan, just being the beginning of that. Uh, we're going to see a lot more happening with the rise of China, the rise of India, and the redefinition of the global structure. The second uh, is that you can reliably hit your quarterly targets. The reality is very few companies do that for more than, you know, eight quarters at a time. And so the reality is that idea of compound growth, the idea that we're going to reliably just do really good every, you know, reliable every year, that's not true. It's not true when the world changes. You need to really think not just about compound growth, but how do you res respond to compound volatility? How do you respond to rogue waves? Because these aren't just threats for the people who are resilient, the organizations that are resilient. These are the biggest opportunities too. Yeah, that's that's really powerful. As we all think about emerging into a world with way more change, way more volatility than any of us have expected, we need to understand that uh, just like investing, as you say, it's not just compound growth. We need to think about compound volatility is a crucial variable that we need to get a lot more comfortable with. And that is exactly what you discuss in the book, Rogue Waves. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And Jonathan Brill, thank you very much for being here. This is fantastic. And by the way, anybody who's interested, please follow me on LinkedIn. I'd love to continue the conversation. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jonathan, and see you all next week.